Hello and a very warm welcome to what is set to be quite a special event for the British Library food season, which is generously supported by KitchenAid. My name is Angela Clutton. I have the complete pleasure and privilege of being the guest director of the food season, working with wonderful Polly Russell, who's the season's founder and its creator for the four years it's been running. Um, a little housekeeping before we get to the excitement of Madge Jeffrey. Um, you should be able to see on screen some tabs. Using those, you can give feedback on the event. You can uh, find out a little bit more about our speakers. You can find their books also, and uh, maybe even make a donation to support the work of the British Library. You might even like to ask your own question. You can do that with a box that's just underneath this video. And there you'll also find the social media links to carry on the conversation on other platforms. Also there, details about the food season competition that we're running with KitchenAid, who are our supporters. That gives you the chance to win a set of KitchenAid cordless appliances, place on a virtual cooking class, and a copy of Canon Franklin's really lovely book, The Pie Room. Okay, all that out of the way, let's get to it. Tonight's event um, with Maddie Jaffrey, culinary royalty, joining us to talk about her life and incredible career in food. She's going to be speaking with the chef and food writer, Ravinda Vogel. We're going to be learning a lot about Madda tonight. So I'm just going to start us off by telling you a little bit more about Ravinda. Ravinda, Bo oh, Ravinda Vogel, author of two cookbooks, the latest being Jaconi, proudly to inauthentic recipes from an immigrant kitchen. Jaconi is also the name of her fabulous restaurant in Marylebone, one of my very favourite places to go to. It's reopened tonight, can't wait to get back there. Ravinda <laughs> is monthly food columnist for the FT Weekend magazine and a contributing editor at Harper's Park. Harper's Bazaar. She's a whiz with food and flavour, as is Nada. This is going to be wonderful. Ravinda, over to you. Thank you so much, Angela. I am so excited about this. It's a great pleasure and honour for me to be speaking to Mother Jaffrey. It's not every day that you find yourself in the company of uh, someone with such greatness, albeit digitally. Mother, you've been an icon and a legend and someone who's had such bearing on my own career. Mother is a polymath, an actress, food writer, cook, broadcaster, educator with a career spanning decades. She's written countless cookbooks, a memoir, two children's books, and has been the star of several TV series and films, including Shakespeare Walla, for which she won the Best Actress Award at the Berlin Film Festival. Many of us now know about uh, the regionality of Indian dishes, about ingredients such as asafoetida and tamarind. We cook with them and we write about them. But really, Mother was the first to demystify Indian food and lift up the veil of complexity that surrounded it. She was born in Delhi in India. Her food writing covers regional Indian food as well as food of the Indian diaspora. She's also collected global recipes from around the world and her books are classic tomes of knowledge that for many have led to their first clumsy foray into the world of Indian cookery. Beyond her fail-safe recipes, her writing is witty, evocative and eloquent and manages to both educate and entertain the reader. Mother, Let's start at the very, very beginning. You were born in Delhi, and when you were a baby, your grandmother inscribed Om on your tongue with honey, and with that, she awakened your palate and taste buds. Do you think it was in your destiny to always work in food? <laughs> I don't know, but it seems to be, because it started with this honey, and then I was named Madhur, which means sweet as honey. So obviously somebody up there intended me never to forget that there's food on my tongue, how important that is and how important the palate is to, to whatever you are, to your senses, to your sense of being and to yourself, your palate is a very important part of it. And Indians are said to be super tasters because we taste so early on spices and so, so many different kinds of spices, so many different things that play on your palate. And you, of course, had that experience in your, in your memoir. You describe such an idyllic childhood full of mango trees and ice cream parties. There's always food, especially the illicitly eaten um, street food that your father didn't quite approve of. If you could click your heels uh, like Dorothy and go back to any one food memory, what would that be and why? 
I think it would probably be the, what we call the Chom Chavala. The Chom Chavala was a guy who had a kind of stand. It was like a, a drum. It went in the center and then it came out on the two sides and he put it down and on it, he had a big tray and the tray held all that a child might desire or an adult might desire. It was what we call chat, chat to lick, to like, to get excited about, to have heat, to have sweet, to have sour, all mixed together. So your palate is just feeling, sensing one magical thing after another in bursts of extreme flavor. This is not just light, nothing, semi, eggy, runny, nothing stuff. This is crunchy, this is hot, this is spicy. And it evoked in us the, what the highest you can go in terms of taste. How much can you taste? How severe the edges could be of taste. And this is where chart led us. So my ideal was this chartwala. And my uncle used to do this very special treat for us that once a year, he would call the chartwala with all his wares, like a candy shop to a Western kid and mm. say, come to the house for the afternoon and the children wow. will do whatever they want. And it's free for the children because we just say this or that and he makes it up for us. But it was the, this wonderful mixture of the extremes of sweet and sour and hot and crispy and salty that he put together. And that even when I think about it now, my mouth waters. Waters. It's wanted, true. Wanted. Even, even you just talking about it. I mean, I think chart is such a nostalgic thing for Indian people. And, and you're right. It's like an absolute party in your mouth because all yes. your senses are going off all at once. All and I in think all directions. Yes. Absolutely. And there are so many different kinds of chart, right? From Pani Puris to Bail Puri, all of those right. things. But they're right. just all. And you you're right. It is. Watery form. You can have it in a solid form. You have, have it in a crispy form. Right. But you're right, because it is, it is in a way, um, for us, like the version of a candy shop. And I remember, you know, my mother not letting us have too much of it. It was like, you'll get a bad throat if you have too much tamarind. You'll have, you have to be, so it was like, there were limits to how much you could have. Yeah. So it was that thing, right? I, I mean, I love your recollections of food, but the ones that particularly sort of stayed with me where there's uh, really voyeuristic recollections and a sort of hungry peering into your school friends' lunch boxes. Yeah. Because what's wonderful about India is that you have people from everywhere. It's so regional, the food, right? So depending on what religion you are or what caste you are or, you know, what part is or where you come from in the country, everyone's food is different. And you were fascinated by that right tell us yeah. tell us a little bit more about that well you know when I started school my school was a very mixed school and it was initially meant it was a Christian school but it was meant for parda girls girls who were in the inner city and wore the veil and they could come to the school and be educated so there were people who came from inner neighborhoods inner cities and uh, they had probably all wore the burqa and they would come in from their, their, in their school buses. They weren't buses really, they were driven by a horse. They were horse carriages, mm -hmm. but they had curtains all around them. And the girls, the door would open and these girls in burqas would jump out, take their burqas off, go and hang them. And of course, then it was party, you know, everybody <laughs> together. The Hindus, the Muslims, the Sikhs, the Jains, everybody would get together and, and eat. So whatever group of friends you formed, let's say you were five or six friends, you may be um, two Muslims, a Sikh, a, a Jain, a, a, you know, a Hindu Punjabi, you would all be together. And we would bring our little tiffin carriers and we would take them out to the back where it was sort of garden-like and we would spread out these uh, tiffin carriers and we would heat them because sometimes in the winter particularly the food got quite congealed 
and then we would share. So then the Muslim girls, for example, from UP or from Delhi would bring their kalia, which was absolutely delicious, or their meat cooked with spinach. It would be spicy and hot. And it had that particular flavor that comes from a Muslim hand. This mm. is what they in India, unke haat ki baat hai. And the hand huh. was slightly different. It was a Muslim hand. And that with it brought a certain taste, a wonderful yeah. flavor that only was in that particular Tiffin carrier and not in it's, the others. And the Jain girl would mm. have her food. And sometimes it would be literally a boiled potato. And I so remember she would mash it in her hands. That too was so sensual, the way we Indians do it with our hands. Mm. We slightly mash it and then open a little packet. It was a, a puri as we so call it, a little yeah. pack, that paper packet and take out a powder and put it on the potato. She would just sprinkle it on the potato and then eat it with a roti or a puri. And it was so delicious. I tell you that just that mixture was absolutely out of this world. So the sick girl might bring uh, an alu paratha or something like that. Mm, All my of us would sit <laughs> and eat each other's food. And we reveled and enjoyed each other's food so much. And then when the partition came, it was the worst political thing for me because my country was being parted and torn up. But it was also terrible for us as people who would meet together, but we yeah. could no longer meet because each group, the Muslims went to one side, the Hindus went to one side. And I remember being sort of in the middle because I wanted everyone to get along, please get along. But and yet, nobody got along. It was very, very difficult. So in my mind, somehow food, politics, they all tie up somewhere in some yeah. very difficult way. I really like what you were saying about, you know, certain hands cooking the food, because I really believe that actually your cooking is about your inheritance. And I think when we come to the kitchen, we bring our ancestors with us. Us. And that's what you taste in, in, in the food. And I feel that very right. strongly that I have all these women who are standing by me every time I cook in spirit right. and they've come with me and they're the ones almost seasoning my food. Yeah, but, you know, right. Talking of lunch boxes, I remember being, um, you know, a, a child in the 1980s coming to England from Kenya, Indian parents. I felt deeply embarrassed about my lunchbox because I got teased so mercilessly. And I used to pray to God that my mother would just pack a jam sandwich and a packet of crisps. <laughs> yeah. And I never got that. I always got these sort of, you know, strongly scented, uh, you know, parathas or like mm. kima sandwiches or whatever it was. When you came to England, did you kind of experience any kind of neg negativity when it came to Indian food? You know, maybe I came so much before you. Uh, I didn't. I didn't. You didn't. I cooked my own food uh, and people liked it. And I would oh, call, I used to entertain just wildly all the time. And I started cooking nothing but Indian food because people loved it. And I had people over and there were people from all walks of life. There were Americans, but from different sorts of Americans. Mostly they were artists because I was an actress and they were, you know, from the art world, painters, writers, uh, actors. And we would all collect in my house and I would give them Indian food and everybody loved it. So I didn't know this side of uh, Indian food. I think it's your generation. And yes, my kids thankfully. Generation that felt it much more. I thankfully, th thankfully, things have come right back around the other way. And now everyone yeah. wants paratas in their lunchbox. Yeah. So thank, yeah. thank God for that. Thank God for travel and for supermarkets, you know, really championing ethnic that's foods it. and all of that's that. It. Just experiencing um, all that. And, and what kind of, you talk about these dinner parties. I mean, how I long to have come to one of those dinner parties with, with all these very interesting friends. What were the kind of things that you cooked well, I cooked everything from biryani and pulao, I, things that I liked. I think yeah. I w wanted to make things that I would want to eat, and therefore I assumed other people would like them. I made lots of vegetables. 
uh, because I like vegetables. So there was always at least one meat. There was always one rice dish, either elaborate or, or not. It could be a biryani. And there were two or three vegetables. There'd be a raita of some sort. It was a proper Indian meal, like Indians would like to serve. And it wasn't stingy. Of course, I was exhausted. <laughs> but I love to entertain. And I suppose in entertaining, it's like acting. You, you get applause, you get, you know, you get your little uh, being told how nice things were and you get happy from that. There's a certain yeah. kind of exhilaration that comes from that. And I have to say that one thing that I did uh, discover about myself and that I found very interesting, when I was growing up, I had no sense of the word palate. I didn't know what the word palate was. Yeah. I have begun to think that over the years that I always had a good palate. Like my husband has a very good ear. So yes. what happens when you have a very good ear is that you not only hear, but you record it in your head and you remember it and you yes. can recall it. These are the things that happen when you can hear well. So when you have a good palate, you taste it, but not just taste it, the little you difference between it. this and that. You remember it, you catalog it, and you can recall it. And therefore, you can recreate it. And this That's is something I learned after many, many, many years, that this is not everybody has it. And you don't have to be an Indian to have a good palate. Other people have good palates in other parts of the world. And they do exactly the same thing. They taste it, they record it, they can recall it, and they can remake it. It's, and that, you're absolutely right with that. It is. It's, it's a bit like having a catalogue in your head. Right, and it's, I, it's a computer brain, really. I mean, I remember having something like a Bengali tomato chutney, not having oh, a gosh, recipe for it. I remember it. those too. But, but being able to recreate it because you can taste those oily spices, the banj yes. pur and all of that. And then, not you know, this, not, it wasn't yeah, this. A it wasn't this, but it was that. Yeah. You get to the dish, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're absolutely, it's taste memory, right? Yes. And it's exactly. what, it's what, what takes you back as well, that sense of nostalgia as well. It's, it's, it, I think food is very emotive in that way. And you see in India, every family has this. So can yes. you imagine how many taste memories are going for those that make it go? Each family has their own traditions. Yes. They're totally absolutely. different. I mean, I may have, I'm a Kaist, and I may have another Kaist family living, you know, in another city, but their taste memories are different. The recipes they remember are different. So can you see how rich a country India is and how much there is for us to tell? Because we see all these different traditions in each and every family. And people say to me, how, what else is there left to say? You've written about Indian food, you've written 30 books. What is there left to say? I said, there is so much I don't know about India. So Absolutely. much, every time, yeah. And cooking in general, I mean, I always say to my team, you know, this is such a gift because we have a, the privilege of doing something which is a lifelong education. You learn something new. You never stop learning. There's so much to, to learn about, you know, cultures always, and cooking, always. always. You never, you're never fully qualified. There's always yeah. something else. There's always something else. And very recently, I went down to Kurk. And every dish there, the spices, was something I did not know, you know, yes, the mushroom dishes yeah. that come in the monsoon season. There were dishes I did not know, and this is true of every part of India. You go to any place and you go deep into that place and you explore it, you will find things that you do not know. I spent a whole month or so in Andhra, traveling from one end to the other end of Andhra. Well, there's so many parts of Andhra. There's so many different types of people who live there, each with their own traditions. And that is what you can find in India. And if I go back again to Andhra again, I'll find more things. So it's an endless supply. And when people say to me, what else there is left to say about India? There's plenty left to say about India. 
You know, I always say, I mean, because you, you're talking about Kurg and Andhra, and I, I always think of spices when I think of Kurg because they have such beautiful spices growing there. And I always say that my my cooking without spices would be like elevator music, just one tonal, not interesting yeah. at all. How do you feel about spices and uh, what are your kind of rules? Because people get so confused by spices, but what are your kind of go-to uh, rules? See, I think the spices are one thing that Indians are, are really magicians at. We are magicians. And why? Because since ancient times, we have cataloged them. We have cataloged our spices for various reasons. We want to know medicinally for each yes. one. What do they do, actually? And uh, as you read, you find things out like asafoetida is a, we know, is a digestive. And I was reading books from the 17th, 18th centuries, and they were saying that it used to be used to cure stallions of wind. When stallions had wind, they were given asafoetida. Arabian stallions that came to places like Goa, when they were, had wind, they were given asafoetida. So it could cure horses as well. So indigestion of any sort. As well, consider- is wonderful with beans, for example. So yeah. these are things that we know medicinally. We know the taste of asafoetida is like truffles, adding a little truffle to a dish. It's the same. When you add truffles, there's a kind of strong taste. And so asafoetida does the same thing. It's between garlic and something else. I have to say, I, I mean, I heard you talk about asafoetida and, and liken it to truffle. And it was the first time I'd had it said, heard it said, and I'd never thought it myself. But the moment you said that, I was like, of course. Of it was course. obvious. I, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful description of uh, asafoetida. And actually, <laughs> asafoetida is, for, is so useful for a country that eats so many beans and pulses. It's, it exactly. completely has its place. Yeah, you have it with your beans and pulses. So it's, it's good to know the medicinal side. It's good to know the taste side. And it, you want to know all the traditions that go with it and then how to use it. This is the other thing. So I find that Indians are really so clever with knowing every aspect with spices in it. And we can cook with one spice, two spices, three spices, four spices, mixtures of different kinds of spices. And it's all just a little bit of magic, a little bit of magic. That's what it is. I always see spices a bit like personalities and according to how you treat them, whether you cook them whole, whether you grind them down, whether you pop them in oil, whether you dry roast them, or their, their personality changes accordingly. Absolute They're changes so interesting. entirely. And mustard seeds, for example, I call the Jekyll and Hyde of spices. Because <laughs> yes. if you just crush them, they're sort of pungent and slightly bitter. But if you pop them in hot oil, they turn nutty and sweet. Yeah. So they yeah. really, they can be absolutely the opposite of themselves. So it's good to I know about that. these things and experiment with these things. And it's very, spices just are a major part of our culture. And we just have passed it down from person to person over thousands and thousands of years. So they yeah. are part of us. I've, I've really been re, uh, enjoying rereading uh, Climbing the Mangoes. And, you know, so much of what you say about your life, re- I really relate to, like, the extended family coming to a new country and, you know, the kind of meals you had with your family as well. I remember those meals, my grandfather being the head of the house and everything. But in your book, you say you, you kind of seem to really bristle against what was permissible for girls as opposed to boys. You wanted to fish, you wanted to shoot and swim just like the boys in your family. And then in your uh, memoir, you've written, my family considered itself very liberal, but lived by the ancient rules of the joint family system where men dominated and only men made it into history books. I wanted to yeah. talk to you a little bit about that and, and ask you as well, was there a specific moment when you, when you sort of had an awakening and knew that you had to find your independence? Well, I went into my grandfather. My grandfather was a barrister and he had a, a 
there was a set of rooms where he worked. So I went into his office room and there was a history, a family history. And it was all always, you know, the man and the son he had and the son he had and the son he had and the son he had. No women in the history books. And I said, what is this? What were the women doing? They were just oh, not. How old were you They were then? very much there, but mm. their work was not recorded. So I thought, you know, this is ridiculous. And in every way, the family was the only people who seemed to matter were the men. The money went from the men to the men to the men. The property went from the men to the men to the men. And the women were sort of completely left out. And I began to feel a certain rebellion, a certain anger that this is not right. I am going to change it. I will do whatever I want to do. And no man is going to tell me what to do. And I think that started pretty early in my life. I think I was six or seven when I began feeling this because I wanted to play cricket. I wanted to fish. And I might, it happened that all my, the cousins my age who were my friend were boys. Mm. So there were six boys and me. And we did everything together. And, and you, were, you were daughter number four, weren't you? Or I was, was daughter that... number five. We were five, six kids. Okay. So daughter number four, sorry, you're right. Daughter number four, but child number five. Okay. And one sister after me, five years later. So I was sort of the last child for a while. And I, I just resented what my brothers could do and what I couldn't do. And I was determined from a very early age to find, first of all, something to do, not be like my mother, who was just mm. a housewife. Mm. I looked at other people who were either painters or doctors, or it didn't matter. As long as they were doing something, I looked at them with respect. And I wanted to find something for myself to do uh, that would placate me in some way and fulfill me. I was looking yeah. for a certain kind of fulfillment that came from doing anything fully and well that I wanted to do. And I Absolutely. knew the day would come. I always knew that one day I would find it. And I hadn't found it yet, but one day I would find it. And I think leaving home, telling my father, getting, I actually got a scholarship so I could go to RADA, uh, but I could go and my father let me go. Which was the so I, thing. I wanted to ask you about that. So actually, so you came, you got the scholarship and you came to England to study at RADA when you were 19. Had you been to England before then? No, or was it a complete no, I've been voyage nowhere. in the dark? I've been in Delhi, basically. Wow. Hadn't so been to was, South India ever. A real adventure. And you, you yes. came completely by yourself. Yes, and I was completely ready. You were ready. So ready for it. It wasn't a culture shock then to come no. from a, you know, a family where you'd been cooked for and then suddenly having to fend for yourself? No, not at all, because something in me was just ready. I was ready to be on my own and I enjoyed every second of it, every second of just being on my own. And I, I just, know that I you're... Was, sorry. You, uh, no, I was going to say, I know that your parents were very supportive of that mood, uh, of, of that move and, and your decision to act. But uh, I was really, I was listening to an interview with a uh, wonderful Arundhati Roy recently, and she recounted a very funny story where she was warned by a friend's mother uh, or her, her mother's friend who said to her, bold girls never get married. And, you know, I've heard similar things myself as, yes, I, as yes. I was growing up. To which she retorted, well, I've been married several times. How did your family and community react to this bold choice of wanting to become an actress? They, I just think that they, they had two perfect boys in yeah. their eyes, two perfect <laughs> girls in their eyes, all good looking, doing the right things. They sort of let, gave me a pass. I think my father just said, let her do what she wants. I you got the, a the test case. <laughs> kid, and the others were so perfect that they just let me be. My father let me be. I don't know what he thought I would come to, but he sort of let me be. And that was the best thing he could have done for me. And so I went to England completely 
unhampered, but I knew a lot about England. I'd read every book. I'd read, you know, children's cartoons from England that we, that we got. I had read all the English novels. I'd been to college. I uh, studied English literature. So it, there was nothing I really didn't know. I watched the news and I was familiar with what England was going to be. I just wasn't familiar with how cold it was going to be. And the pea green smog that came in at three o'clock at that time in the 1950s, late 50s. But other than that, I was ready. I was prepared for the bad food. There was no Indian food. Yes, let's I was come not to that. prepared for that. Let's, let's it, come to your memories of English food. I'd love to hear about the kind of things that were available to you then. Well, I'll tell you, I'll start with the good stuff. There was only okay. one thing that was really good and really cheap, and that was fish and chips. Oh. So much better than they are today. So much better. It was really good quality fish. Didn't smell of horrible oil. And the chips were delicious. And I used to eat that a lot because it was good. But as for the better English food, I say there was, I couldn't afford whatever if there was better English food, it may have been somewhere, but I couldn't get it. And what I got at my Edrada when we took these five flights upstairs to the cafeteria, you got sort of ro see through roast beef and cabbage that had been oh. boiled for days and potatoes that had been boiled. And you would just sit there and dream, dream of the Indian food that you had left behind. And it was all so fresh from straight from the garden, the vegetables are fresh. The chicken was absolutely scrumptious in those yeah. days, it really was. Yeah, and, not tampered uh, with. And what you were getting was really nothing. So that's when I started dreaming <laughs> about Indian food. And actually I went to a few Indian restaurants, but they were so bad and so general and so awful. I said, yeah. this, I can't eat this rubbish. It's not possible. And Before that, I get Yes. Sorry, I was just going to say, I was just going to remind the audience that uh, they can also send their questions before I get into to my next round of questions. I wanted to, to talk about um, how you made this, this amazing move from, from stage to kitchen and then to presenting your own cookery show for the BBC. How did that all happen? Well, the thing is, I didn't think I was making a move at all. All I thought I was doing was to make my life bearable and interesting, was to eat decent Indian food. <laughs> I had to learn how to cook it. So then I started writing letters to my mother and saying, you know, please teach me how to cook. I'd like to make curry masala ka gosht, for example, which mm. is uh, meat with whole spices. And for meat, we, we all meant goat. That is what we meant. Mm -hmm. And uh, but there was no goat available in those days. I wanted to learn how to make cauliflower, cauliflower with potatoes. And my mother would send me these three line recipes, take a little bit of this, add a little bit of this, and then brown it, buno it, brown it a little bit. Yes. And then when it's done, then you eat it. So I think it was my memory. This is when the memory started kicking in. I would try mm -hmm. what my mother said. And if it didn't seem right, I seemed to know instinctively what was missing and what I needed to add to correct that problem. And I was able to correct it. And my idea was just to feed myself. I had no intention of feeding the world or writing cookbooks. So that was not in my head at all. And then I left and came to America to work, to work. I finished RADA, I came to America and I, the idea was to find work as an actress. And I had great trouble because in England, I had learned to speak with a sort of British accent by that time. Mm. And there was I looking not really like an Indian to most people who wanted an Indian as an actress and not really like a Britisher the way I spoke. So I was yeah. sort of not being cast as anything. And I was sitting <laughs> around doing nothing. So I would just cook for the family or cook for friends. And that's where that, Thing of entertaining started. I just started entertaining lots of people. Come for dinner, come, <laughs> I'll make you food. And I would experiment and make food. And that's how it all started. And then I think uh, I did this film, Shakespeare Walla, 
Yes. Uh, which uh, the food writer in the New York Times was persuaded to do an article on me by Smile Merchant, who was the greatest persuader of all. Uh, and he persuaded him to do an article on me as an actress who cooks. So I actually I had no kitchen. I borrowed somebody's kitchen and made something for him. And he said, I'm going to come back tomorrow and we'll do a proper you may cook in front of me. So I had to borrow the kitchen again from somebody <laughs> else and make it again for him. Anyway, he wrote a wonderful piece on me. And as a result of that, I was approached by people who said, would you like to do a cookbook? And that's really how it all started. It was very, an odd way to start. But, uh, and also I was writing, I was writing a lot. Yeah. In all the magazines about, you know, things I knew something about art, dancing, painting. Uh, and I happened to write one article on somebody said, would you like to do an article on uh, Indians uh, and what they what the food that you ate as a child? I said, mm -hmm. yes, I'll do an article on the food I ate as a child. So I did one. And that, too, then led to this whole business of people thinking I could write about food because they had great requirements about people who wrote about European food, but none about people who wrote about Asia. They didn't know much about Asia. So it was a, it was Asian a complete... could write about Asia in their minds, I think. So I started writing for all kinds of magazines about food in India and then starting to do books on food in India. And then one thing led to another and I was soon being called an expert. I never was an expert. And people who call me chef, I shudder because I'm not a chef. I'm not a chef, I'm a cook. I'm just a housewife who learned how to cook and who had a good palate and managed to make a good living at it. But I am not a chef. I chop onions slowly, you know, <laughs> like I don't chop like a, a professional at all. I cut slowly, I, I believe, in the, in the sort of Ayurveda, which says, you know, this chopping and cutting, and these are the graces that lead the soul upwards. And I do believe that because yeah. you do them slowly, you do them calmly. And the soul yeah. has nothing to do but rise as you're doing these wonderful activities. So I do believe in that aspect of Ayurveda a lot. As a, as a cook, I mean, you really were responsible for creating an appetite for Indian food. And then you fulfilled it as well by writing these home cooking recipes that actually really, really worked. In fact, I remember when I was growing up, it wasn't mother knows best. It was mother knows best. <laughs> so if we had any questions, it was your books that we turned to. Were you surprised to have had such wide appeal and success? I'm not, uh, in a way, as I look back on it, I'm not surprised because I was like you. I was another you. I knew nothing. I started from nothing. So I felt I should explain every detail as if I was seeing the food for the first time. What would I want to know? If you're browning onions, what would I want to know? I would want to know how big a pan are you using? It's going to make a yeah. difference. How much oil are you putting in? What's your heat? Is it low, medium, hot? I want to know all these things before I start so I don't make a mistake. So I wrote for you because I was you in many ways. And I think that is probably the answer why my book sold and why the recipe did well. Because when people made them, they turned out, as they turned out for me, they turned out for you in exactly the people, same. People uh, trusted you. And I think that, um, you know, if, what, once you have that trust, I mean, I, I mean, you're such a great writer as well. I mean, you're writing not just recipes, but just that sort of per, you researched your recipes so well. And you spent ages, I think five years to, it took to write your first cookery book. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you while we're on the subject of writing, you have, I mean, you have such a melodious way of writing. And I was uh, reading about Maya Angelou, another great writer who said that she wrote um, on a bed with a dictionary 
an ashtray, a Bible, and a bottle of sherry. I wanted to know about your <laughs> writing rituals. What do you have with, with you? Where do you write? Well, I always have a little food in front of me. When I, in the olden days, when I was writing much earlier, it was always some kind of chivra or something like oh, that. Delicious. It's a mixture of nuts and spices and it's a little like chaat, but not quite like chaat. Mm-hmm. And I would eat that. And I, I discovered that for every recipe, I put on eight pounds. And I said, <laughs> this, is, this is not going to work because eight pounds and then eight pounds and then eight pounds, this is no good. So and writing's I, pretty sedentary too, right? You're just yeah, sitting there. Writing sedentary. Right? You sit and you <laughs> just do nothing but write. And I would write for sometimes, you know, 20 hours. And I would be eating this chira, which is not very good to do. <laughs> then I changed and I started, what can I eat that's not going to put on weight? And it became radishes and it became radishes with a little seasoning on it. And then it, you know, it sort of kept changing to trying to write with just a whiskey, which is, of course, calories. But <laughs> uh, I loved whiskey and I used to drink whiskey. Uh, not so much now. Uh, but I drank uh, whiskey then. So I would sit with a whiskey and write and write slowly. And, uh, but it kept changing. And now I, I try and write with no food. I try and keep the food out. At the most, sometimes I'll take a popper. Okay. And, yeah. a popper, and I will sit and eat with that. But I try not to eat because it's so easy to get into the food and yeah. keep eating. It's just and, very easy and- for me to do that. And of course, while you're writing about food, that's just hunger inducing in itself. I mean, exactly. one, of the, one of the things that slightly frustrated me, and I wondered if it had frustrated you, was that, I mean, you're so knowledgeable, you're so well-traveled. Did you struggle with the constraints of just being com- commissioned to write exclusively Asian recipes when, when you've traveled all over the world and, and you've written I globally? That. I hated being pigeonholed. And I really would go up to editors and say, why can't I write about Italy? I've been to Italy 50 times and I love Italian food. Why can't yeah. I? Write? They wouldn't let me. They wouldn't let yeah. me. And they would let an, uh, an American white writer go to India for the first time. Yes. And write two pages on Indian food and never having been there. And yet yeah. I couldn't do the same with it. And yet having been you there. couldn't, yeah, you couldn't be an authority on, yeah. on Italy. I, I really hope that that's, that's still it's changing. something it's I think changing. Even, it's, it's changing, changing slowly. Yes. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, travel, you know, because we're all grounded. You're in uh, the countryside, right? Upstate New York right now with your right. garden. Yeah, and with our house, my house with my garden. But you love traveling. So if you could travel right now, um, where would you go? And what is your fantasy of what you might eat when you got there? Well, the last fantasy, let me tell you the last one. The last one was uh, Peru, because I wanted two things. I wanted to go to the Amazon area Mm -hmm. and see everything growing there, because everything I knew was the root of everything I am eating. A lot of the things that I'm eating originated in the Amazon. So I wanted Mm. that. Then I wanted to go to the high mountains of Peru because the potato originated in that area. And the potato is such a great thing. I remember reading something that some Indian wise men said that the best thing the European has given us is the potato. (laughs) (laughs) You can't argue with that. (laughs) We cook it in hundreds and hundreds of ways. And so I wanted to go to the land where potato originated and see it for myself and write about it. So I wrote a piece for the Times uh, about it, but I didn't go for that reason. I got the piece for the Times after I decided to go because I was curious. I wanted to see the land of the potato and go up into those high mountains uh, and just see it for myself. And it was such an experience to see the different types of potatoes with their different textures, totally different. Some are sort of translucent and slimy. They're all different from each other. And it's such a world to find out. And then there was the Amazon where you saw the origin of the tomato 
the first tomato ever, you know, was tiny and how it developed from that. So there was so much to learn. So it was a learning trip and a, a, a trip to just be so happy about discovering all this new world. So now what is left? I w- there's still places that I so want to go to. There are parts of Africa that I would love to. I would love to go to Nigeria. I've not been yeah. there, written a lot about it because I've had friends from there. But I know so much food has developed there that I yeah. love to eat, like Koku Paka, those lovely chicken dishes and coconut yeah. dishes. We have it on the menu dishes. at Jikoni. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'd love you to taste our Koku Paka. I want to ask as well about, um, I mean, your, you, obviously food is a big part of your life, but so is music because Santa Dal and your husband is a classic violinist. Right. What kind of music do you listen to while you're cooking? What's the kind of soundtrack to your life? In the you kitchen. Know, it's very strange. I don't have a soundtrack. It's very silent because mm. my mind is going so fast as I'm recalling things, tasting things, that I like utter silence when I'm cooking, which is unlike most people. Most people have some kind of music on. I don't. I no, just, I'm with you on that. I am absolutely quiet and I'm thinking and I'm concentrating on the taste of what I'm making. And the taste is all, absolutely is all. Even when I'm cooking my everyday dishes. The other day I did something with spinach where I used the roots. It was sort of spinach that had wintered over and the roots were so tasty. And I wanted to find a way to cook them that I got the taste of the roots and I didn't somehow I wanted the taste of the spinach to be there, but the taste of the roots to be there. And I was working it out as I went. So I was in total silence as I was thinking and tasting. There are some lovely questions coming in from the audience here. Jackie Robinson wants to know, uh, she says she loves your books, first of all, and she wonders if you have a favorite food writer or cookery book that you turn to. Well, the cookery books that I like, strangely enough, are by people. I don't know how England is familiar with them, but they're like of the French food that I love comes from Julia Child. And hers yeah. are very explanatory books that tell you if this goes wrong, you do this. If this goes wrong, you do that. She has solutions for all your problems. And she has very true French dishes. So I love her. I love Marcella Hazan. I don't know yes, if you're familiar I love with her. her. I love her books. I, I love, love her books. Her tomato sauce with butter is it's the best wonderful. thing. Yes. Who so would have thought see, to put butter in an Italian tomato sauce? Exactly, it's wonderful. Exactly. <laughs> so I love her books and I use her books. And for different, uh, for, for Chinese food, I use somebody called Irene Kuo. I don't know if you well, know. I'm not her, familiar but with her. No. It's wonderful because it goes into the, all the details um, that you need to know about how you take chicken and just let it cook in water or oil just to start it off for a few minutes and then it's ready to put into dishes. Uh, sure. So, all these things, I like details. I like these details that some people give. Uh, for their local foods. So I like Irene Poe for Chinese food. So it, it depends on what I'm cooking. I love David Tannis. Do you know David Tannis's book? Yes, I do. I do know David Tannis's book. And I Wonderful. Think he has my taste. The taste is very similar to mine. And I, so I, I love, if he's cooking rabbit, I'll cook rabbit. I, whatever he's making is fine with me because it's always to my taste. Amanda Clegg here wants to know what would mother say is her signature dish and what does it mean to her? And would it be the same dish now versus 20 years ago? Signature dish. Well, it keeps changing and the recipe mm-hmm. keeps changing. So I have a new recipe now for aloo gobi and in which the potatoes are boiled. I take the cauliflower and cut it into pieces and I brown it before I do anything. I really brown it because I'm not going to be able to brown it later. So the raw cauliflower and potato, I brown together. 
Then I sure. put the spices. And, and brought them for a little while. Then I put a little water and let it cook. So it's just how I cook it. And I keep changing. So this is one of the current dishes that I'm making that I've changed the recipe for. And you'll find it in my next book, probably. Uh, this particular recipe for cauliflower and potato, but it's quicker, it's easier, it doesn't burn and it doesn't get too soft, but it's soft enough to break by hand to eat with a chapati. That's the wonderful thing about cookery as well, is it's about the kind of adaptations and the evolution. And I wanted to ask you actually, what do you think about the evolution of Indian food in particular and how it's going? Well, it's going in all directions. What will last is what we'll see. We don't know which of the many variations that people are trying are going to last and pass the test of time. So I will just wait and see. I will not judge it. I will eat it and either enjoy it or not enjoy it. But I will give time a chance to do its magic. And we'll see what remains 15, 20 years from now and what is gone. I'll tell you what will remain dull. People dal. will never get enough dull. They will always, I love you know, dal. mountains can crumble and all sorts of things can happen, but they will always be dull. And I particularly love your uh, description of dal as LSD, life-saving dal. It's, yes. it's wonderful. Yes, yes, I <laughs> love it's that. It's exactly that. Yes, I could and, eat dal, roti or dal and rice anytime, any day. Give me one vegetable with it and maybe a yeah. raita and a pickle or two and I'm fine. People always sort of, you know, they ask that question often to cook. So what would your death row meal be? Mine would definitely be my mother's dal, rice and a char. I'd be really happy going yeah, out on I'd that. I'd be happy with that. Uh, one of my <laughs> last minute uh, deathbed foods is also noodles. I love uh, the various noodles that come out of Kerala. So I would be happy. Idiapam, I would be happy. Yeah, delicious. Okay. I think pe people are always so surprised to find um, uh, noodles in, in, Indian, in India generally, in Indian food. Yeah. There's another question here that says, um, when you first wrote a book for the UK market in 1973, uh, who did you think you were writing for? Who was your audience? You know, I have no idea. I was sort of writing for myself and writing for anybody who cared to listen. I just wanted people to know that Indian food was not curry, that was one of the main things that I wanted people to know, uh, whoever they were. I didn't know anybody would be interested. And uh, I wanted people to know the variations that you could get in Indian food, the variety. So my first way of writing for people was to tell them what I ate. So the first book is really filled with the dishes that were served in my home. So this is what I eat. What do you eat? How do you eat it? This is what I like to eat. And that's what I presented to anyone who cared to listen. Over the years, what have been sort of the greatest misconceptions that you would like to quell about Indian food, the things that really irritate you? They still irritate me, and that is this <laughs> whole thing of curry, curry, curry. What is curry? It's so generalized, that word. Does yeah. it imply curry powder? Does it imply all Indian food? What does curry mean? It's always bothered me. And I've not come to terms with it. And I've sometimes felt if you can't beat them, join them. And I've used the word curry myself only to regret it later. So I've had a battle with the word curry all my life. Um, there's so many more questions coming in. Ava wants to know, hi, mother. And this is a question I had for you. What's next? What's your next book? Also, do you think Fish and Chips was better when you first came to the UK? I think you answered that part already. It yeah, was but, better. Yeah. What's new? What's coming, Ava? Is that what she wanted to know? Yeah. And I, I mean, we've seen... I am working on a book. Of course you are. You're so industrious. I can't, I can't imagine you sitting still, mother. <laughs> no, I don't. And it's a book on Indian food and medicine. And it's not the medicine. I'm not a doctor and I'm not going to go into that. But I'm doing a book on 
what we inherit from our families, what we are told by our families, and all the dishes that we are told are going to be good for this, good for that, good for this, good for that. And I'm just recording it historically as I was told these things. So grandmother's um, sort of kitchen um, medicine Lord. in a way. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I love that. Do you know, I picked up a book recently. I was in a, like an Indian supermarket and there was a book like that. And I opened it to a page and there was a, a thing for, you know, uh, coughs and, and, and all of that. And then I turned the page and I was absolutely shocked because the next grandmother's law was how to do a, a, a home abortion. I was like, what? Oh, my God. But, Oh my this God! This is the thing—the power of spices and and sort of women. Of I mean, when, you know, this is what women did back then. It's in of very. Course. I found it really it's what interesting. Women did. Um, I wanted to know. I mean, we've seen so many manifestations of you. We've seen the actor, the cookery writer, the memoirist, and then recently, of course, the berry wearing, cigarette toting, potty mouthed uh, nani rapper. Do you have any more kind of um, film projects or anything like that lined up? I don't talk about them because I don't know what will happen and what won't happen. Let's see. They may be. I, I hope so. I loved Nani. I thought she was yeah. brilliant. That was such <laughs> you, fun to do. Did you, yeah, did you enjoy doing that? You had to learn oh, all the so words, much. I guess. So much. I just had, uh, we shot it in two days. And it was, we had a whale of a time shooting it. You know, uh, Mother, you've always had such an amazing zest for life and such a great attitude to life. I was really curious to know whether you have a motto that you've always lived by. No, no, I don't have a motto as such, but I, I like to stay active. I like to work and I'm a perfectionist. I like when I'm doing something, I want to do it really well. I, I won't let loose ends be loose ends. I'll try and cover everything. So it's done as well as I can do it. I have another question from Eleanor Ford, who says, I have recently uh, uh, finished writing a manuscript for a book about the history and movement of spice. Your curry Bible has been an invaluable source of research and inspiration for me. I wanted to say a sincere thank you for your pioneering work that has guided me and so many other food writers. So it's not a question as such, it's just a compliment, yes. which is- Thank you back. Thank you so very much. Very well deserved. And um, Siobhan wants to ask, um, she, she says, it's such a pleasure to be here. I'd love to hear about your food memories of Nelson Man Mandela. Oh, gosh, yes. It was fabulous, you know. I, I, I think I wrote about them. I, I was talking to somebody who was working for the African National Congress, and I was in touch with her. I needed a, a contact in South Africa, and somehow... She was the one I reached, and she had worked with Mandela. She was, she's died since. She was an older, beautiful woman, very pretty, extremely pretty woman. Like you. She, well, very, very cute. And she had worked with Mandela. She said, I'll set it up for you. I'll have uh, all the women who used to work with Mandela, these were all political women's kids. I would have all of them come and cook for you. So you see the dishes, the kind of dishes that were that we served each other during the years we were fighting for independence. So I said, fine, I'll be there. So she had made sure that Mandela's cook was there, who was going to make a bean dish that uh, Mandela liked very much, which I wanted mm -hmm. to record uh, because I wanted to write about it. So it was, she, she was there, the cook was there, I was interviewing her. I was talking to the other ladies who were the kids of all these political men and women of the movement to free South Africa. And I was just doing my work when suddenly a door opened. I saw these flashing light bulbs and there was Mandela coming oh. through. And he said, how could I not be here when all these beautiful ladies are here? <laughs> <laughs> And he came in and uh, we sat and I sat next to him and uh, he was at the head of the table. I sat to his right. And throughout dinner, we were chatting about him being on Robin Island and 
the food he ate on Robin Island and what he had to do, they were made to go in naked into the water to get these pierced pins, uh, these lobsters that had pincer like, you know, uh, so, legs, yeah. feet. And they had to get these lobsters for the guards to eat. But sometimes they would let them have one or two. But he was telling me all these stories. And it was absolutely a magical, magical lunch that we had sitting together like that. Well, this has really been magical. And I, I really hope that you're, you're in London very soon and we get to have lunch again. I would love soon. that. And uh, I'm going to hand over to Angela. It's been such a pleasure speaking to you, Mother. Thank nice you so you. much. Thank you. My goodness, I had every intention then of pretending that my camera and my microphone weren't going to work and then you guys could have carried on and on and on and on and on because that was completely just joyous and moving and motivating and an absolutely wonderful way to spend an hour. Thank you both hugely, Rabinda and Mada. That was Thank just... You just the loveliest conversation. Um, thank you also to KitchenAid who support the work of the British Library Food Season. Um, we have more to come. The food season runs until the end of May. Tomorrow afternoon, Friday lunchtime, we have a, a film actually, which is Odia Hercules cooking and talking with Elizabeth Leward. And that's part of our Lunchtime Legends series and will be completely lovely. Um, head to the British Library website and you'll see all the information there to book your place. Um, if you would like to support the work of the British Library, you'll see the donate button on your screen. All I can say again is just the most enormous thanks to Ravinda and Maddie Jaffrey. What an honour to have you as part of the British Library Food Season. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I think from the messages we had coming in, I feel fairly confident that you did. Um, so thank you and goodbye from the British Library Food Season. <laughs>